So in this presentation, I'm going to tell you more about my perfect sub, my, my favorite subject, my perfect, <laughs> my favorite subject, which is uh, latency SLAs, and the things that we do at Scylla to make sure that you always have low latencies, consistent latencies, and etc. When I use the word latency, and, and I'm talking here about high latencies and low latencies, what I really mean is latency event events, so things that happen that make your latency spike. Uh, and, and what we're doing to solve some of those problems. So I want to start by uh, asking a rhetorical question. Like when we talk about latencies, a lot of people have their opinions uh, about why do I have high latencies? If I had to replace parts of my database, which parts would I replace? Uh, should I maybe replace the storage engine? Uh, and would that, get, would that get me better latencies? Would that get me uh, latency distribution with uh, fewer spikes? Or maybe if I would not have garbage collection, like this is a discussion that is happening right now uh, in the Cassandra mailing list, like maybe th there are new garbage collection algorithms coming to Java, and will that, if, if you use one of those, will that guarantee that you now have very good latencies? And obviously, Whenever you have something that is not good and you improve, things get better. But the message that I want to get through is like, if we ask ourselves, where do latencies come from? The answer in my experience, and, and I've been doing this for years in Scylla and trying to help our customers identify where those latency issues, those events come from, the only possible answer that I can give you is everywhere. I am yet to meet a subsystem in Scylla that hasn't been responsible for some latency spikes. There is none. Uh, so what I'm going to do in this talk is uh, show you some of them. Uh, what are they and what we did in the specifics of that subsystem to make the latencies go lower. The first one I want to talk about is the IO scheduler. Uh, so this is what we had in the past with Scylla. This curve is, is just a graphical representation generated by a tool, but what we used to do is try to have a statistical process that draws mathematically a curve like this. And what this curve represents is the throughput, uh, the throughput of an SSD or NVMe drive as the concurrency grows. Uh, so what we do is we're sending a lot, we, we pre-write a file and we send a lot of four kilobyte requests down to the storage array uh, and we, we try to plot this. And if you look at this curve, what you see is that it kind of, this drive is really good. So at 150 requests in parallel, maybe that's the point that I'm starting to hit my bottleneck. That's the point I want to be. Uh, so we stop at 150 because the graph stops there, but maybe maybe the, the, the threshold, the point that I'm look, looking for is even a little bit more to the right. But let's call it 150. And, and the red stuff that you see there is the average latencies and, and also the standard deviation at that point. So if I send more requests, uh, my latency grows up a little bit. And for this device, again, really, really good device at saturation, I am sustaining 300 microsecond average latencies. So that is the number that Scylla will tell you. When you configure your disk, uh, 100 and, 150, Scylla will not ever send more than that to the storage array, and your latencies are going to be 300 microseconds. Great, except that's not true, because if I plot the same curve, but now I am using 128 kilobyte requests, uh, you can see that the saturation point happens way, way lower. It happens at around 30 requests, and at that point, my latency is no longer 300 microseconds. My latency at that point is two milliseconds. So if I send 150 requests, because that's what uh, uh, the, the tuning utility gave me, I'm going to be way past the saturation point in this scenario. And sometimes we do have to send bigger requests. And the naive approach would tell me that maybe I can measure reads just fine, because reads and writes are just two sides of the same coin. But unfortunately, that's also not true. Uh, if you think about, for instance, the AWS uh, uh, i3 Meadow, which is the large instance that has a lot of, I think, eight, in, eight NVMEs, uh, just as an example, that instance can do six gigabytes a second in the write path. So if you're writing, I can write six gigabytes a second. That's a fairly good number. 
Uh, but it's not even impressive if I compare it to the reads, which is 15 gigabytes a second. So again, I am measuring reads, and I am measuring four uh, kilobyte reads. But if, if my requests are write requests, then I'm, I'm going to be, again, way past the saturation point. So what happens in that scenario uh, is that I have a queue of requests now that are waiting for it to be processed. So if, I, if, a, if a four kilobyte request comes, or even, or, or even smaller than that, it's going to have to wait in this example for at least 12 milliseconds. Why is that? Because I'm assuming that each of those requests will take around four, uh, that th those disks in which I have two millisecond latencies at 128K, plus their write requests. Uh, so it's still not a bad behavior because those latencies are bounded. So the first thing we want to do with latencies is make sure that they are bounded. Even when they're bad, th there is still like a threshold in, in over which you don't cross, but they're not great. Uh, I would like to get this request to go down immediately down to the disk. Uh, so what we did in, in newer versions of Scylla is that, uh, so you see this is at least 12 milliseconds there. What we did in newer versions of Scylla is that we changed the way we measured this. So we found a way to essentially de derive the point that we want, derive the information that we want, which is the concurrency of the disk from those four properties, which is essentially the read and write bandwidth and IOPS, uh, and IOPS here is essentially random operations, and my bandwidth is like if, with, with small requests, and bandwidth if I'm trying to do like sequential operations with uh, fairly large requests. So I'm measuring now all of those four properties, and from those properties I derive the amount of requests that I can send to disk. Those relationships are not even close to linear, so the naive approach that is just, just a count of uh, 128K request as a bunch of four kilobytes requests do not work, uh, and, and we came up with, a, I have a blog describing exactly the technique that we are using if you're interested, but essentially what happened uh, is we're now measuring more things about your device uh, instead of just trying to measure the one concurrency point. And the results for that, again, if you compare Scylla 2.3 and, and, and uh, Scylla 2.2, Scylla 2.3 is the version in which we introduce the new I.O. scheduler. And what I do in this benchmark is that I get a super slow disk, which is EBS. Uh, and why is that? Because I want to saturate that faster. I want to make sure that the latencies and saturation are worse. Uh, and, I, and, and I have a read workload. So this workload is just essentially reading stuff from the database, and while that is running, I just call node 2 compact, which is, generates a, a major compaction, so all the data in our database will be compacted, uh, and those are the results. We can see that the average latency is now 40% better. My, my P, uh, the P50, I'll just ignore. P95 is 85% better. And then as the, as the tail latencies get even higher, uh, in this specific use case, I don't see a lot of difference because those Tail latencies are actually coming from the hardware itself, so I, I won't see uh, necessarily a big difference. But in, in the P99, even as you see, I mean, the, the latency is almost twice as good. And we did that by essentially, again, changing the I.O. scheduler and trying to make sure that I'm, I'm really as close as possible to my original goal, which was to be at the saturation point. Again, so the summary of that part, uh, the saturation point is not a unique point, it's actually a, a, a collection of points, and I'm tracking all of those individually. The second thing that we did, I did mention that in the keynote, which is the CPU scheduler. Uh, so we had an IO scheduler from the beginning. The CPU scheduler is a newer addition to Scylla. Before that, the assumption was that your disks got a bottleneck you, and because my concurrency is limited, then that will transfer to the CPU. Uh, but that became less and less true uh, with NVMe devices, Optane devices, and, and things like that. Uh, so we started to see Scylla being bottlenecked by the CPUs in a lot of situations. The i3 Metal being one such example, because if you can read 15 gigabytes a second, that's a lot of gigabytes. Uh, and, and probably you got a bottleneck by the CPU. So again, if you had those CPU bottlenecks and the disk, what, the disk was so fast that it didn't stop you, uh, at that point you would have a latency event. You would have a, a, a lot of tasks that are, are, are a lot of compactions, for instance, that were ahead of your reads, that were ahead of your writes, and I had essentially no control over that. So what the CPU scheduler tries to do is it, is it tries to keep all of those classes. This, it, it, the, the functioning, the principle is very similar to the I.O. scheduler. So we'll try to keep everything in separate queues. So I now have a compaction queue. I now have a mem table flush queue. I have a repair queue. Uh, and then I have my request queue. And as you saw in, in the keynote presentation, I can even split that further into, use, in, into different user queues for your, your uh, analytics workloads and for your operational uh, real-time workloads.
And we're going to move from one queue to the other every 500 microseconds. So this number is configurable, but we're, we're keeping it at 500 microseconds, and there is a reason for that. Uh, so what that, what that means is that I can actually start framing my latency guarantees as multiples of 500 microseconds, right? So uh, if, if I have a request that runs, and I, and I, I now have a compactions, and I, and I have uh, mem table flushes, and I have repairs, I know that my latencies are going up by around one and a half milliseconds. Uh, assuming, of course, that I can, I, I can do your read request inside one of those periods without having. But if I can't, then now I'm talking about three milliseconds for that percentile or whatever, if the requests are more expensive. So uh, still, again, essentially the ability of, of having the latencies being more predictable in every percentile. Uh, I can now reason about them in multiples of how many, how many tasks, uh, how many groups I had to switch to and from. Uh, to get the, the to essentially uh, serve my request. It, all of those things are based on shares, uh, and the CPU scheduler is based on shares, the IO scheduler is based on shares, and a graphical representation of how that works is that if I have the blue, blue class with 100 shares, and if I have uh, the red class with 100 shares, they're, they're, we're gonna run like blue, red, blue, red, uh, one after the other, but if all, out of a sudden I come here and I change the red class to 50 shares, I'm gonna be running the blue class a lot more. Uh, so those are, uh, again, this is the same thing for the IO scheduler as it is for the CPU scheduler. Uh, on top of that, we have the controllers, and uh, what the controller, uh, the main difference from between this and the keynote is that I'm gonna show you some graphs now and explain a little bit more uh, how are they done. Uh, I used previously the example of a car uh, and cruise control, and that's actually a great introductory example, but I don't like it that much because it's not that accurate in terms of how we do it. The goal is the same, uh, but a much more accurate example in, 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 in terms of how we implement those algorithms is a water tank or a dam. Uh, because most of those things, like compactions, you don't necessarily want your compactions to be at a specific rate. You just want them to be not too fast or not too slow. So you, you can think of it like, uh, like we have a dam, and, and if you have too much water, it's gonna overflow, and if you have too little water, you're not gonna be able to power your, turbine, your, your turbines. So you, you essentially want those things in, 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 inside a range. So that is how the compaction controller works. Uh, the mem table flush controller works more or less like that. It's just way, way, way simpler. Uh, but what, what, it, what it's trying to do is that every single millisecond, uh, every, every time the database is running, it's gonna adjust those shares to try to find the correct point, and then, again, keeping your latencies under control. Uh, this is an example, like a, graph, a graphical example of how that works. Uh, what I have here in green uh, is uh, my throughput. Uh, this is a throughput curve, request per second, and those requests, if I'm not mistaken, they are a kilobyte uh, big in size. Uh, and the yellow line is the percentage of CPU that is being utilized. And for that particular workload, the controllers decided that I'm, I'm using 15% of, of my CPU. And again, as somebody asked in the keynote, I mean, this is not a function that we learn, it's just a result of, an, of a, a PID-like controller. Uh, so we, the set point is around like 15%, so I'm using 50% of my resources, in this case, both CPU and IO, uh, to power my compactions. But now I start to ingest requests that are bigger in size, uh, so they're, they're, they're much bigger, they're maybe four, five, six kilobytes, and as a result, I can do less requests, and each request individually is, is, is much bigger. So the pressure that it puts on compactions are now higher, and 15% and is not ideal anymore. 15% will make us lag behind, so the controller automatically gets us to a point in which I'm running close to 20%. 20% uh, of my resources, CPU and I.O., are now being used to operate compactions. Uh, so this is the result. If you look at the result of that, you're going to see a graph that is all full of waves. Uh, so at sometimes compactions, and this is of course before the CPUs, uh, the, the controllers, I, I already had the scheduler in that situation. So what I'm guaranteeing here again is that even in the low points, my latencies are still bounded. They're not that bad because uh, there's, the, the, there's a maximum that you can use anyway but I'm not, a, I'm not doing any share adjustment. Uh, when I start doing share adjustment, you can see that the graph is a lot smoother. So the latency is in there, uh, and, and why is that? Because the, the, the shares are not changing that wildly, and, and I don't have periods with compactions and without compactions, so essentially my latencies are way more predictable. 
And as Dor alluded to in his keynote, of course, there is more work to be done. Uh, those, those waves are now not due to the controller. They are due to the fact that the controller operates on, on by reading the amount of memory that both things are using. And there are some parts of the database in which the memory estimation is still not 100% accurate. Uh, but even then, I mean, if you compare the previous behavior to this behavior, it's a way more, uh, it's a way smoother behavior, and, and your latencies are now a lot more under control. Uh, if you compare throughput between one and the other, this is Scylla 2.1, did not have the, had, did not have the controllers. Scylla 2.2 has the controllers. I can even do more throughput out of that because I'm not running more compactions that, than, than I should. So uh, in this case, I'm doing like 18% more throughput. Those results are all in the 2.1 versus 2.2 blogs, uh, and you can see that more in details in there. Um, so I said before that when, when it comes to CPU scheduling, we have this test quota, uh, which is how often I will switch from one class to the other. Uh, and currently it is at 500 microseconds. Uh, so again, the latency guarantees are going to be some multiple of 500 microseconds. Uh, however, not everybody is well behaved. Not every task is well behaved either. And there are some tasks that they just don't respect that quota, uh, especially because Scylla, uh, uh, Scylla works in a, a cooperative scheduling model. So uh, my threads, um, they're not really threads, but my, my tasks, they have to yield to somebody else. Uh, and in some cases, they just don't. Uh, one example, for, uh, let's, let's imagine I have to sort an array as part of a responding to a request. And that array gets gigantic. I cannot be preempted, so I cannot just sort parts of the array. Uh, for that, we have a block detector. So the block detector, what it's gonna try to do, it's gonna try, try to identify those tasks. So what are those tasks that are not respecting the 500 microseconds that I established? Uh, and maybe they're running for 10 milliseconds. So if you're, if you're unlucky enough to be running a task uh, that doesn't yield in 10 milliseconds, I am essentially not able to make that guarantee because it couldn't take you out of the CPU. Uh, if you're using Scylla and you've, if, if you have seen those ugly backtraces that we print to the log sometimes, your reactor stall for however many milliseconds, that's what they are. Uh, they look like bugs and we do treat them like bugs, but they're not like crashes. Uh, they are essentially telling us where is this request coming from so we can look at them and fix them. In some cases, the fix is trivial. In some cases, the fix are extremely complex, uh, but we, we'll do them anyway. Uh, so we call them a test quota violation, or uh, in the parlance of the logs, those are reactor stalls. Those are some of the subsystems in, uh, from which we actually saw stalls. Uh, large memory allocation, so maybe uh, you're sending a request and you're sending a big blob, and I cannot uh, allocate a small buffer, I have to allocate a four megabyte buffer because you sent me a four megabyte request, and, and, and et cetera. Uh, so Allocating four megabytes is not necessarily easy, so the allocator may have to go search for, for a memory area, and that takes maybe three, four, five milliseconds. I broke my, my, my uh, latency promise to you. The memory allocator itself, so sometimes the memory allocator has to do the fragmentation of memory and things like that. That can take time. The cache, uh, we had a lot of uh, uh, situations in, in which if your partitions in the cache are like tens of gigabytes, and I have to evict that, those 10 gigabytes out of the cache, that takes a while. Uh, and because you had to done in one big chunk, uh, you, could, you could have a latency event of a couple of milliseconds because I'm moving this out of the cache to put something else. The IO subsystem, as a stable writing. So when we were writing as a stables, there were some things that would happen, like for, for instance, creating the Bloom filter, uh, that you had to allocate that big array and, and, and move from partition to partition. Uh, the Bloom filter generation is the, the next sub-example, and even the Linux kernel. Uh, so we had plenty of, uh, of events that were generated by XFS. So I, I ask XFS to allocate me a file, and it takes 10 milliseconds. So again, I, I broke my promise to you because the file system uh, took 10 milliseconds. And all of those examples are actually examples of stuff we fixed, and then I have a toilet paper long list of the things that we haven't fixed yet. Uh, so there are even more, and as I said, that drives, drives home the point that I wanted to make in the beginning of the presentation, latency events are coming from everywhere. Uh, in Scylla 2.3, uh, we fixed a lot of them, and it, we've been fixing uh, reactor stalls for a long time now, so I, I don't mean to imply in this slide that, hey, we found out about all of those issues in Scylla 2.2 and fixed them all for Scylla 2.3. Uh, on the contrary, we've been fixing those uh, over time. But in particular, we, we managed to fix some pretty nasty ones. So if you look at the latency curve of Scylla 2.2 versus Scylla 2.3, you're gonna see this very clearly. 
Uh, in Scylla 2.2, I had my P99. This is the P99.9, actually, so 99.9 .9 for writes. Uh, and it's oscillating between four and six milliseconds. Again, it doesn't sound that bad. Uh, if, you, if you look at this in comparison to some other databases, and if you have one point at 100 milliseconds, you're not gonna even see that in the graph. Uh, but we're really zooming out here, and I am uh, fluctuating between four and five, uh, four and six milliseconds. There are some points that are slightly over six milliseconds, but that's the range Scylla 2.2 was at. But after we fix a lot of those stalls, Scylla 2.3 is now very close to four milliseconds the entire time. So why is that? Because I had some events that were taking like two milliseconds uh, and I could not essentially, uh, I wanted to, to get you out of the CPU to run something else. Uh, in particular, most of those are coming from mem table flushes and compaction. Uh, so I, I, I wanted to take the compaction process out of the CPU so I could run your request, but I could not because it kept running for two milliseconds and then that's where you see a spike between four and six. Um, and it doesn't end there. There is, there is a lot more. So as I said, they're really coming from everywhere. Uh, latencies, uh, latency events, they're not, uh, they're not specific to any specific subsystem. What we want to do is we want to preempt more. So we, we, we're not happy with the test quota being 500 microseconds. We would like this to be even lower because we would like to make guarantees that are much better than like a millisecond or, or things like that. To do that, I need to do this more often. I need to do this maybe at 100 microseconds, maybe at uh, 50 microseconds or something like that. Uh, but the problem is that every time I do this, I have a context switch. And the way our architecture works, every, every time I do one of those posts, that's my cue to do I.O., which is actually a good thing. The more often I do I.O., the, the, the faster I can serve your request, because I, uh, this request is probably waiting now. On, uh, the incoming request is waiting on a socket for the network, so I want to get to that socket more often. Uh, and to serve this request, I maybe issue a, a, a request to the, to the device, to the storage device, and I want to be able to consume that request sooner. So doing more I.O., doing I.O. more frequently, it's actually a great thing for latencies, the problem being that doing this is extremely expensive. So it can take a couple, a couple of hundreds of microseconds to do this, to go to the kernel and back, and to do all of those I.O.s. So how can I do uh, 100 microsecond uh, periods if, go, if doing this takes 100 microseconds. Uh, the solution for this was not in Scylla. Uh, there isn't anything that Scylla can do. So to solve that problem, we had to go all the way down to the Linux kernel, and we merged into Linux 419, a new polling API. Uh, so that's work sponsored by Scylla. It essentially, what it does, it exposes a ring buffer between the kernel. I'm not gonna go into the nitty gritty details of what exactly this is doing. Uh, there are plenty of material to be read about that on uh, Linux Weekly News or other sources. But in, in principle, it's gonna expose a ring buffer in which the kernel and, 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 the, and Scylla, the user space application, can share information about events, and then Scylla can now consume those events without doing a context switch to the kernel. So without going to the kernel, some, not all, but some I.O. events can be resolved at that point, especially in the case in which there isn't any I.O. So I can now just, uh, instead of going to the kernel and finding out that there is no I.O. to be done, I can just not do anything. Uh, so I replaced a multi-microsecond operation with a couple of nanosecond ones, which is a memory read. Doing this, I can pull more often, and, and my latencies can get even better. This code is already merged into the Linux kernel, but is not yet present in Scylla because it's a re uh, reasonably recent addition. So we actually we have, a, of course, the experimental code that we use to test all that, but it still has to come into a Scylla version, but it's coming soon. The Linux kernel is the most basic layer on, on, on any Linux-based system, right? So again, latency uh, problems are coming from that. As I said, we fix a lot of bugs in the XFS file system, uh, things that would take a lot of time and maybe some allocations. Uh, the asynchronous API turns out not to be that asynchronous. So sometimes uh, it would just block for a couple of milliseconds and we've been very diligently fixing one after the other. That is the base, the first layer, but there are also issues in the upper layer, which is the client. You have you probably heard already in the, this very summit about the uh, Scylla uh, specific drivers. So the Scylla drivers, they work just as well with Cassandra. We don't wanna break compatibility, that's not what we're doing, so I wanna make this clear. Why you, you've been using Cassandra drivers for all this time, uh, you're compatible with Cassandra, why now you want to have your own Scylla drivers 
because we got to the point in which, in which we want our latencies to be even lower. So what happens with uh, connections in Scylla is that the connections are bound to a specific CPU. We're gonna have a talk just about that, but in brief, a uh, connection is bound, is bound to a specific CPU, but that doesn't mean that that CPU owns that data. So I'm gonna have another hop. It's not a network hop, it's a CPU hop, but even then, it takes time for this one CPU to send the request to the other. Uh, and especially because we have to respect maybe that CPU is running something else, and I might have to wait those 500 microseconds for that request to be consumed for the other CPU. So by using the shared aware drivers, I am eliminating this hop, I'm eliminating something that can cost me up to 500 microseconds uh, or, or even more if I have a stall and we're gonna have performance numbers in the shared aware drive talk but that is uh, again the, the very first layer there, there are latency issues there and the clients in, on the client facing layer there are some latency problems that arise from there and everywhere in between we have those things. So the summary, I mean, keeping latencies uh, predictable, keeping latencies in a bounded state is very important for us. Uh, it's not, we, we're talking more about other things now. We're talking about control. We're talking about uh, per user SLAs. That doesn't mean that we forgot about performance, that we forgot about uh, latencies and keeping them low. We will continue to work on that. Uh, those events, they really come from anywhere. I am unable to pinpoint one source of latency events. They are all the way from the Linux kernel up until the drivers. Uh, and, and we're gonna keep investing in that. And I'm, uh, I'm hoping to be able to give, give you a talk in the Scylla Summit 2019 about how we make those things even better and even more stable. Thank you.